Good evening. My name is Reverend Shannon Blosser. I am the pastor here at Pew Ridge and I Methodist Church, and I thank you for joining us for our online Bible study for today. Thank you for joining us on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel as we gather together in our homes or office spaces or wherever we may find ourselves to study scripture together. These discussions are about 30 minutes or so in length. They're intended for us to just have a deeper discussion or conversation around a topic of scripture, a, a book of the Bible, or an issue that we are wrestling with today. As always, you can find many of our previous Bible studies by going to our Facebook page and scrolling down where it says videos and then looking under the playlist of Bible studies. As we are studying tonight, as we are discussing, we invite you to like, share, comment, that is a way for you to stay engaged as well as to share with others what God is doing here at Pew Ridge and I Methodist Church. We also invite you to post your questions or comments about what we are talking about tonight. It's a way for you to stay engaged. It's a way for you to wrestle with what it, you are responding to as we are talking about the Gospel of John today. And we will come back after the Bible study and answer those questions in the chat. And so we hope that you will do that. Utilize that. That's a way for you to stay engaged as well as to respond to what's going on in your soul. And we also invite you to do that on Sunday mornings as we are worshiping, as we are reflecting on scriptures and talking about where God is leading us. And we hope that you'll do that as well. Today we are in the midst of the Gospel of John, but we're going to look at another aspect of these ways that you can characterize the Gospel of John and ways that you can see within the Gospel of John how John is using these statements or literary structures as a way to identify Jesus. Last week, we talked about how John uses seven signs to discuss Jesus and to identify something about Jesus. But today, we're going to look at another characteristic that is unique to John in how he introduces us and describes the person of Jesus. So we invite you to join us for this discussion. We hope that you will grab your coffee. As you can see, I have my nice, handy-dandy human being coffee it is great, by the way, in case you were wondering. And so we hope that you will join us and engage throughout this night. But as we begin, I want you to hear this word from John chapter 6, verse 35 through 40, as a way to frame our conversation. And then we'll turn to a time of prayer. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Will you pray with me? Most holy and gracious God, Father, Lord, we give you thanks for this night and this conversation. We ask for you to join our hearts together wherever we may find ourselves or whenever we may find ourselves to hear your word speaking to us. In Christ we pray. Amen. As I said, we're going to look at the seven I am statements, these statements that John uses from Jesus as a way to identify the person and the divine nature of Christ. John has a unique structure to it. And we talked a little bit about his structure last week and the way that he organizes his thoughts. We said that there were two unique usage of sevens. There were seven signs, and then there are seven I am statements. And these are ways to identify Jesus. They are a way to describe a little bit more about who Christ is and what he has come to do. And it stands in contrast in a lot of ways of the messianic expectations that were prominent in that time. It's John's way of describing who the Messiah is and why he is the Lamb of God and why he is the one we have been anticipating. And so there are these seven I am statements. And what's the significance of seven? Seven is a number of completion throughout Scripture. And so in a way, John is saying this is a complete way of looking at who Jesus is, or that he is the complete representation of the Word of God and the divine incarnation of the Word of God and the second person of the Trinity, because he is 
God incarnate. And so we're going to look at these statements. We're going to look at what they mean to us. In many ways, they come after an important healing or sign. Many of these statements come after a sign. Some of these statements come in the midst of a festival or a divine moment in Jesus's life, or they come to anticipate something that will soon happen. So these signs, these statements, I should say, are important for us to hear. They are important for us to reflect upon. They are important for us to study and to engage. And so there are seven. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And I am the true vine. So these are the seven statements that we will look at tonight. We're going to look at the first one of I am the bread of life. And we're going to look at all of these in the order that they come to us in the Gospel of John. We're not going to look at as which one is more theologically important or anything like that. I feel like they are all theologically important and they're all relevant for us to express and to hear and to reflect upon. So there's not one that's more important than the other. They're all on equal footing as far as I'm concerned. So we're just going to look at them as they appear in the Gospel of John. The first one that comes to us is, I am the bread of life. And that comes to us in John 6, 35. And we've read a little bit about that earlier in our setup to tonight's study. And this comes immediately following the feeding of the 5,000. John is like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and sees the feeding of the 5,000 as a significant moment in Jesus's life. He doesn't include the feeding of the 4,000. He just focuses in on this feeding narrative of the 5,000. But what's unique about this story is that it leads into a discussion about who Jesus is. John discusses that people have come to Jesus. They have come. They are excited. They are wondering, who is this man that can provide bread and fish for a whole thousands and upon thousands of people? And so they are unique. They are interested, I should say. They are wondering who this Jesus is. And so they're coming wanting more of that. They're wanting more of the show, so to speak. And so Jesus is engaging the people on this and asking what are they really looking for. And they say they want this bread. They want this bread that Jesus gave. They want another miraculous sign. And Jesus has discussed and said, look, food has come from God. This manna from God, which is a reference back to the Old Testament, when God sent manna to the wilderness when they were hungry and crying out for food. It's a call to the wilderness story and a call to that wilderness experience. And so Jesus is saying in a way with this phrase of I'm the bread of life, that he is the true bread. The bread that you saw in the feeding of the 5,000 was just a sign looking towards this moment where he is giving true bread, true life, true connection to God. So what is this bread of Jesus? What is this bread of life that he gives to those who follow him? Well, for one, it's his word. It's his teaching. It's his interpretation of God's holy law and holy word. It's his life. It's his connection to God. But it's also his obedience. It's his obedience to the divine will, his obedience to this life and our calling to be like Christ and be obedient to God in our lives as we are fed in God's truth and God's wisdom and God's will. And so anyone who receives his bread of life are seeking to be obedient to the very teachings of God and the very life of Christ manifested in our lives soul through the Holy Spirit. And so this bread of life is our sustenance. It is our connection. It is what fuels us. It is what sustains us. And Jesus says, anyone who receives this bread, anyone who receives this life will never go hungry. That's why communion is so important for us. When we take of the bread and we take of the cup, we are reminded that Christ is the one who sustains us. That Christ is the one who fuels our hearts. And we seek to leave the table transformed 
by his holy love and his holy grace. So that's the, the bread of life. And that's the first one of the seven that we're going to look at. The next one is, I am the light of the world. Now, this comes in John 8 through 12. And the context is a little unique to look at because of the Gospel of John and the way that John is going through his words in the manuscript of John. When you look at John 8 through 12, you, you probably think the context of this statement is the story preceding it. And the story preceding it is Jesus redeeming or protecting this woman that was about ready to be stoned, who was caught in adultery. But if you look at your Bible, most Bibles have that story in brackets. We may look at this later on in our study about what is unique about this story. In fact, we probably will. And so I don't want to give it all away, but those brackets tell us that some of the earliest manuscripts don't necessarily include this story. So most likely this is an in-text insertion, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And so if we want to look at the context of John 8 through 12, we almost have to go back to John 7. And when we look at John 7, we see that Jesus is celebrating the festival of Sukkot, or the festival of tabernacles or booths. This is one of the three festivals that were prominent in Jesus' time. They are still important holy festivals for those of the Jewish faith today. And this festival is a sign of the, of the remembrance of the wilderness experience. You would come to Jerusalem. It was one of those, those pilgrimage journeys into Jerusalem that you came into Jerusalem to celebrate and to experience. And so this festival was a time in which he remembered the wilderness experience of being in the wilderness for 40 years and depending upon God and depending upon the sustenance and the presence of God in all things. One of the aspects of the festival came towards the end of its celebration. Not only did you create these tents or these um, shelters for you to stay in throughout your time in Jerusalem, to study and to celebrate this festival, but there was also something that took place in the Court of Women. The Court of Women was one of these outer courts that surrounded the temple. If you remember from what we talked about in the sermon on Sunday, we said that there was the Court of the Gentiles. And the Court of the Gentiles was an outer court that it was as far as the Gentiles could go into the temple. Well, the Court of the Women was very similar to that. It was a court that was in the inner side of the temple, and it was as far as women could go into the temple and into the presence of that worshiping space. And so in that temple and in that court of women, you saw things that both men and women could participate in. And it was where you saw the treasury boxes, because both men and women would give their gifts to God in this area. And so this was where the treasury boxes were located. And you see some of these practices still taking place today in Jerusalem. If you look at the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, which is as close as the people of, of the Jewish faith can get today to where the Holy of Holies and the presence of God existed in the temple. And that's about as close as they can get today. And it's why you see so many people praying at the wall. It's why it's a very holy spot to pray, and it's one of the most moving places I've experienced of prayer, uh, to pray on that wall. And when you look at the wall, there's a, a line or a wall, a gate that kind of separates right down the middle, right down the middle of the wall. And on one side, the side that's closest to the Holy of Holies is where men go. And on the other side, further away from the Holy of Holies is where women go. And so when you enter into that area, men go to the left and women go to the right. And so that same practice comes out of this practice of the court of the women and that time of worship and those worship practices that were prominent in those days. And so within the court of women, you had these bowls. And these bowls were filled with oil during the festival of the tabernacles. And they were filled to the brim, some 16 in all. And the wicks were, that were used were the, outer, the undergarments for the priest. They would use their undergarments and use them as wicks. And they would place them in the oil and they would light all of these wicks throughout the whole court of women. 
And so what came up was this spectacular light show that lit up the entire city of Jerusalem or what Jerusalem, the size of Jerusalem then, Jerusalem is so much bigger today through annexation. And it lit up the whole city. It was a sign of God's light in the midst of darkness. And Jesus is calling upon that scene and calling upon that celebratory moment and saying he is the true light that has come in the midst of darkness. That he is the light that shines truth in the midst of darkness. That he is the light that shines hope in the places of despair. He is the light that will break free sin and evil. Jesus is using this imagery as a way to say he is the one who's bringing salvation and justice to every person through his divine presence. I am the light, he says. These next two, we're going to look at kind of together. And the reason we're going to look at them together is that the context for them are very similar. And so this context of both, I am the gate of the sheep and I am the good shepherd, they both come in John chapter 10. It's the only place in the Gospel of John where we see two I am statements come almost right on top of each other. And Jesus is using this imagery of shepherding. And shepherding is a famous image in the Old Testament for leadership and caregiving. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. And what we see in the Old Testament using this image of shepherding is a sign of leadership, is a sign of caring, is a sign of protecting, is a sign of looking after someone who is vulnerable. And so Jesus is playing on the image bank within the people of that time of calling into their minds of this idea of gate and shepherding. And in an agricultural community, in a farming community, these would be images that people knew off the back of their hand. They knew them freely and without hesitation. That's why it's so important for us to understand the Old Testament to read the New Testament, because without the Old Testament, you can't really understand the images and the context within the New Testament. One of the other aspects of context within John chapter 10 is the festival of Hanukkah. Now, we know Hanukkah as a winter festival that is celebrated almost at the same time as we celebrate Christmas. And we see it as the festival of lights and the the menorah with the eight lights that each day has a new day to light. But the festival of Hanukkah is a intertestamental festival. And what I mean by that is it comes in the period between the ending of the writings of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testamental period. So we're looking at a period of somewhere between 400 B.C. and 4 B.C. That's about the pure intertestamental period. Well, this particular festival, and this is the only time in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that we see this festival of Hanukkah mentioned. And so Jesus is in Jerusalem celebrating Hanukkah. And what Hanukkah references is something that took place in about the 160s B.C., about 165 B.C., in the Maccabean Revolt and the Maccabean War. And what was taking place there in that time was the Greeks had come into Jerusalem. They had come in and they had taken over. This is after the fall of Jerusalem and after the fall of uh, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, where Jerusalem has gone through periods of overtakers and they have gone through periods of people coming in and taking over the nation. And so the Greeks are in charge now and they are bringing in their own culture. They're bringing in their own ways of life, and it is polluting the temple, and it's polluting the cultural practices of the day, and they're polluting the faith. And it's got people upset, and it's got people angry. So the Maccabeans led a revolt to take over Jerusalem and to bring back the temple, and to bring it back and cleanse it, to purify and rededicate it. And this took place in about 165 B.C., And so what he is talking about in the festival of Hanukkah, what we're celebrating in the festival of Hanukkah, is this moment of purity in this festival of rededication of the temple. 
And so Jesus's context for this, I am the gate of the sheep and I am the good shepherd also comes in this time of discussing leadership and who are the true leaders, who are the true messianic divine leaders from God. Remember, people were expecting a Messiah that would come in like perhaps the Maccabeans, and come in and just dominate the Romans and to bring purity and bring connection back to the way it always was, to do things the way it's always been. But Jesus is coming and saying, I am the gate of the sheep. And what he means by this is saying that he is the entrance point for people. That gate in a, in a sheep fold or in a, an enclosure for a sheep for is what protects the sheep. It, it's what allows you to come in or to go out. And so what Jesus is saying in John 10, 7, is that he is the one that allows people to come into the sheepfold. He is that one that brings divine connection. He is the one that provides protection and leadership. And those who come after him must lead like Christ and must lead with that divine hope. And so Jesus is the one that seeks to identify as that gate, the one who is bringing people in and trying to keep out those who would harm. By saying he is the good shepherd in John 10 through 11, he is the exemplar of divine protection. The shepherd would lay their life down for their sheep. They would be willing to go out in all the elements and all the, the various aspects of life in order to protect their sheep. I think I've shared this story with you before of this time when I saw a Bedouin shepherd going up and down near the northern parts of Israel in the Golan Heights, walking with his sheep just moments after we had seen an area that said, do not cross because you were entering landmined areas, places with landmines. And that image has always stuck with me of how a shepherd is willing to go, even when it is dangerous, in order to care for someone else. And that's what Jesus is saying here with this image of, I am the good shepherd. He's willing to lay down his life willing to go to the cross for his sheep. To be a shepherd is to show love and care and divine connection and divine hope and presence. So that is, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. And we jump over to the next chapter into, I am the resurrection and the life. And this comes to us in John eleven twenty five, 25, but the whole of John 11 sets up this one statement. We talked a lot about this sign last week. So just to reiterate what this chapter represents, Jesus has come to Lazarus. He has come to Mary. He has come to Martha in response to reports that Lazarus is not doing well. These are disciples. They are these are probably people that are part of the 70. So these are not just not the inner core of Jesus' disciples, but they're on the, the next rung of leaders and connectors to Jesus. They are people that support him. They are people that will share the news about Jesus. They are supporting him. They are connecting. They're pro probably providing for him in a lot of ways. And so Jesus gets this word about Lazarus, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits. He waits until about the fourth day in order to go. And that's about the time and the connections of that day when you believed or felt like there was no hope left for that person, that they were gone. They were, there was no chance for them to come back. And so when all hope is lost, when all despair is present, that is when Jesus has come in. And Mary greets him and she's grieving and Martha comes out and she's grieving, and Martha comes, and she is not afraid to talk and say, Jesus, where in the blue blazers have you been? That's the West Virginia interpretation. Where have you been, Jesus? We've been waiting for you. 
We trusted you, and you didn't come. And Jesus engages this and says, don't you believe in the resurrection? And Martha is not in a place where she wants to have a theological conversation. She's like, yes, yes, Lord, you know that I will see him at the end of time. And Jesus says, no, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He says this as a way to anticipate what's to come in the raising of Lazarus. But he says it in a much deeper way, that those who experience the resurrection today will experience true life because Jesus is the source of life. That the resurrection is not just something that we will experience in some future date, in some future time, but it is the presence of God realized and experienced now because the Christ is alive. And so because Christ is alive, because Christ himself will experience the resurrection as he will when he goes into Jerusalem in just in, in a few chapters and is raised in chapter 20, he becomes the source of life, the one who has conquered death. What Jesus says is that death cannot win. Life has power. Love has power. Hope has power. And it's more powerful than any death could ever imagine. He is the one who is hope. He is the one who is divine grace. Jesus says that right before raising Lazarus to the dead and right before his own resurrection. These last two statements have similar context. We'll, we'll share a little bit about the context for both of them. And the context as where both of these statements take place, is within the final discourse. And if you remember what we talked about last week, the final discourse is a literary structuring agency, or, or guide, if you will, that will help in the writings of that time to understand a hero. So the author of the book, or the author of the, of the writing, will use these final discourse, which is a long St statement or long speech by the hero of the story to describe this person's life, to allow that hero to describe the worthiness of their actions, as well as to anticipate their death and what they are leaving behind for those who will stay with them. And so that's what we're seeing in this final discourse, it is Jesus using this long speech, or really John using a long speech from Jesus as a way to further identify why Jesus is dying and what is going to come of his followers. And so Jesus is sitting in the Kidron Valley. He is sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane with his followers. This is after the meal at the upper room. This is after they have left and they have gone across the Kidron Valley and they've gone to the Garden of the Gethsemane where most of this discussion takes place. And the disciples have had some conversations with Jesus, and Jesus is saying, I'm about ready to leave you, and where I'm leaving, you can't come just yet. And Thomas speaks up for the group, and Peter has spoken away before, and they, they're all saying, we want to go where you're going. Give us a map. Show us the way. And Jesus responds by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's preparing them for what's to come, but he's saying, I am the way to true life. The only way to get to God, the only way to experience the Father's love, the only way to a true life in God's holiness is through Christ. He is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. And in a time in which we seek multiple ways, in which we're trying to find our own shortcuts to get around different ways, is a reminder that God is the only way, that Christ is the only way of life and truth. This statement becomes, in a lot of ways, John's key thing of who Christ is. He is the way, he is the truth, he is life, because he is the word of God, because he is the lamp, because he is the light that shines in the midst of darkness. The final statement comes in John 15, 1, and that is the, the phrase of, I am the true vine. It comes within a scene, also within this final discourse, but also within what they would have seen as they walked across the Kidron Valley. They would have seen the, 
the temples, and they would have seen these large curtains coming down from the temple that would have had vines on them, or images of vines and grapes. And vines was an Old Testament image for Israel. Israel was seen as the vine that grew from God, that they were the true connection to God. And what Jesus is saying by saying that I am the vine is saying he is the one that provides true connection to God. That everyone who seeks to be connected to God, that everyone who seeks to be in a relationship with God must be branched to the vine of Christ. Must be a part of that branch and produce fruits and abide in Christ's love. The statement of, I am the true vine, calls us to ask ourselves, are we a part of that vine? Are we seeking to grow in the likeness of Christ? Are we seeking to produce fruit that is reminiscent of the ways of Christ? Each of these statements in their own way reflect the very nature of Christ, the truth of Christ, and the love of Christ. They show us who Jesus is. They teach us what it means to abide in Christ's love. They teach us who Christ is in the hope and the love of Christ. And what it means to be a follower, follower of Christ today. And so we look at these statements as a way of identity of Christ, but also how are we identifying ourselves in Christ? How are we being a part of the vine of Christ? How are we seeking Jesus as the true way? How are we seeking Jesus as an exemplar of life, as the witness of life? How are we seeking to live as caregivers because Christ is the shepherd? How are we leading in our communities and in our connections because Christ shows us the way of true leadership? How are we being the light in the midst of darkness? in a broken and hurting world? And how are we living and being fed by the bread of Christ? These are all questions for us to reflect upon as we study and as we respond to the I am statements. Looking ahead to where we're going on Sunday morning, we're going to look at John chapter 3 on Sunday. And John chapter 3 is one of the most famous passages, one of the most famous interactions in the Gospel of John. It leads us into that famous verse of John 3.16, but we're going to look at a verse within John chapter 3 that is often ignored, and we can't ignore it or else we miss the whole of what John 3 is all about and who Christ is all about. So that's coming up Sunday at 10.45 a.m., and again, we'll be online only this week. But next week, as we gather for our weekly Bible study, we're going to look at something very difficult. I don't think a study of the Gospel of John would be complete, especially with some of the structural issues and some of the systematic issues and some of the things that we're experiencing in our life and our time today. I don't think a study in the Gospel of John would be complete without looking at how John uses the phrase Jews. And how that phrase, in the way John uses it at times, has been misunderstood, as well has been used by Christians and those who claim to be Christians in some very anti-Semitic ways. And so we are going to look at that next week. We're going to take a deep dive into our own past and our own history in looking at this usage of this word in the Gospel of John, and to ask ourselves, what do we need to hear and what do we need to do better? So that's coming up next week. Hope that you've had a, a holy study tonight. Hope that this has been meaningful to you. Hope that this has opened your eyes to something about the Gospel of John and these I am statements. Hope that you will leave in the comment section something that has stirred you in your imagination or in your thought process about John or about Jesus. And I hope that you will do that. But as we go forth, as we prepare to depart tonight, will you join me in prayer? 
Most holy and gracious God, Father, Lord, we give you thanks for this night. We give you thanks for this study. Lord, we ask for you to open our hearts to who you are and who you are in our lives. So in Christ we pray. Amen. Well, amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of these studies. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. And I look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue our study in the Gospel of John together. God bless you, and I'll see you again soon.